Well, it's three o'clock exactly, and um, so I think we are ready to start. Hello, everyone. My name is Javier Teran. I'm a statistician and the data partnership team lead at the Center for Humanitarian Data. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the third in a series of data sets deep dives. Uh, this uh, series of webinars are intended to highlight the most relevant and interesting data sets that we are hosting on XDX, on the Humanitarian Data Exchange. We have been hosting already two webinars, as we see, with integrated food security phase classification. And the second one was with CRED, the Center for Research on the Epidemiology of Disasters. Both webinars can be rewatched in our Centers for Humanitarian Data YouTube channel. This webinar, as Karim has mentioned, has, is going to be also recorded and will be uh, put online after the, the session. Uh, we have exciting deep dives planned for next year. The first one for 2021 will be with CRED, where we're going to be, no, I'm sorry, with ACAPS, where we're going to be talking about the API and the data that they have put together. And we host another webinar planned for 2021 with the World Bank and with the University of Oxford, where we're going to be talking about the high frequency surveys for COVID-19. Um, as you already know, XDX is part of the Center for Humanitarian Data, and the mission of the center is to increase the use and impact of data in humanitarian response. The center was created in 2017 and is focusing on four different areas. One is data services, the other one is data responsibility, also looking into data literacy, and we're also working on predictive analytics. I'm not going to go in detail into this, these areas uh, because it's not the aim of this webinar, but I really invite you to look at our website and learn more about the work that our my fantastic colleagues are, are doing in these different areas. Um, however, I want to take the opportunity to highlight some of the work that the center team has been doing. And for instance, is this COVID-19 data explorer, which is a data visualization that puts together more than 25 different sources in one single platform. So the idea is to give uh, decision makers and the humanitarian community uh, information about what and where to distribute humanitarian aid. I really invite you to go surf around this uh, visualization and see if there is anything that can help you with that. Um, as I said, I want to take much time for these introductory words, and I want to introduce uh, today's agenda and also uh, our partner for today's session. So I'm very happy to welcome World Pop uh, project colleagues, and in particular, Andrew Tatum, that we have been working already for several years, and I'm very happy, Andy, that uh, you are joining us this time. And um, I have heard you speak many times, but every time I hear about it, I learn something new. So uh, we will have an introduction to Andy about the World Pop uh, work in general. Then uh, we will go with Gottfried Takabarasha, who is the XDX data manager, to, to walk you through and use World Pop data sets hosted on XDX. Then we're going to go into the deep dive session with Andy and Alexandro Sorieta and Maxim Bondarenko to a little bit go, go into the details of how different uh, gr uh, gridded population data sets can be uh, uh, used and also uh, found on the different platforms. And then we will have, I think, enough time to go through questions and some feedback that you may, may have. So we have, I think, Perfect timing. And again, thank you to all the now even more than 125 participants that joined this session. Uh, I'm aware there are so many webinars, very interesting webinars going on, uh, even at the same time that this one, where I'm happy that you decide to be with us. So with no more uh, delay, Andy, the floor is yours. And thank you for joining us. Firstly, in this section, give a, a 
brief overview of. Can you please start over? You were on mute. Oh. Um, you're not you here anymore. Go, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to give a brief overview of ever the wider World Pop group and what we do, and then um, a more detailed talk later on of uh, the going into the gridded population data sense. Um, so if I can share my screen, I don't have control at the moment to to do that. Right. Andy, you should be able to hear your screen now. Sorry for that. Yep. There you go. Great. So, um, yes, this is, I'm um, just going to minimize this. So, um, yes, the World Pop Group, I'm going to give an, an overview first. We're uh, an applied research and implementation group. Um, around 30 of us at the University of Southampton, though this what I'm going to present draws from many other people's work, past and present in WorldPop, um, and wider collaborations. Um, we have a very focus on mapping small area population distributions, demographics, and dynamics. Um, and everything we do, we, we aim to make open, peer-reviewed, um, and get user engagement. Uh, and some of our key application areas are, are in epidemiology, maternal and newborn health, and childhood vaccination, and active research at the moment. Um, so, as I said, a, a big focus is on everything that we do and all the data sets that we put out, making sure there's uh, some peer review behind them and an academic publication that you can refer to to get much more detailed validation um, and some kind of um, sense of the limitations of the data sets as well. And throughout the, this presentation and the other presentation, of, uh, you'll see in the bottom corner I've put references where possible so that you can find out more. Um, data sets that are on our site at the moment, you can see there's actually a total of 44,674, um, mostly population count data sets from multiple time periods, multiple age and sex structures. Um, you can see there are other forms of data on there that I won't have time to go into, into in detail, but things about migration flows, um, flight data, um, urban change, internal migration. Um, we also make available portals to explore that data so you can get some easier insights if you don't have GIS skills um, and also yeah, applications to actually explore and extract information from those data sets. Um, a key part that is, has really grown and is something we uh, have pushed and very happy with uh, over the last few years are is the engagement with with governments, with end users of the data, and be able to, to pass on the, the, the skills and uh, methods to, to others so that it's not just us doing the, doing the work. So, um, yes, it's pretty obvious to most of you who are, who are on the call that small area demographic data underlies a range of things that, are that governments, um, international agencies rely on, whether that's the basics of planning elections, calculating GDP, local governments, and of course, disaster response and humanitarian needs that HDX has a focus on. And on the, the right hand side, there's um, areas that have been in heavy use over the last year in terms of relating to health systems, uh, controlling infectious diseases in the COVID era that we're in. The challenge is often that demographic data has challenges. And this is not just in low income countries, this is across the world. Um, in many cases, data it can be coarse resolution, particularly that data that's publicly available. It can be outdated. Um, it can be, even when we're doing a regular census every uh, once every 10 years, there's a lot that can change in that interim period. Data can be incomplete in some uh, low income settings, and it can be inaccurate, it can miss key populations, uh, uh, key uh, areas of the country. So what we do in WorldPop is try and integrate and complement traditional data sets with some of the newer forms of data that are coming along and are improving all the time, whether that's from satellite imagery uh, mapping the Earth at night or mapping of individual building footprints extracted from satellite imagery or the movement of mobile phones. And we integrate those all together as a kind of stack of data. So we're, a lot of work we do 
um, and uh, Alessandro and Maxim on the call also are in charge of is integrating these data sets together. So that's traditional data sets of population counts, matched boundaries, um, the location of health facilities, road networks, um, the movement of people mapped through um, smartphones, the movement of mobile phones, and then the mapping of uh, infrastructure and uh, individual buildings more recently. And what we're trying to do is move from this coarse data or incomplete data to uh, a gridded picture of the Earth. So each grid square, um, 100 by 100 meter grid square, an estimate of the number of people. And this is something that we'll talk about in the next session in a, in a bit more detail that we've done for the, the entire world here, producing estimates for the year 2000 to 2020, annual estimates of the age and sex structured. Um, uh, is a, a picture of those those trends. But again, we'll go into more detail in a bit. And increasingly, over the last few five years, is um, a census independent population estimation. So, in those settings where there hasn't been a census for a long time, or the census data that does exist has major problems with it, is trying to uh, produce methods to, to fill those gaps using uh, new techniques and new data sets. And here's an example for Afghanistan where. Uh, data could be recent data could be collected uh, in these pinker areas. Uh, the modeling approaches will enable enable estimates in the, in the rest of the country. And it's mapping population characteristics as well. So bringing together data sets on population distributions, uh, their age structures, here yeah, the proportion under five, um, estimates of those receiving the first dose of measles vaccine, uh, female literacy rate. Uh, proportion living less than $1.25 a day. So overlaying these data sets to try and get a, a, the, the subnational patterns. And then uh, methods for, for scaling those up. So it's a, a lot of work we do on maternal and newborn health to estimate births and pregnancies, and then link those with data sets on things like uh, nearest hospitals that can, uh, that can deal with uh, deliveries. So looking in this case at uh, mapping pregnancies and how far they are from nearest hospitals. Um, we also do work on mapping population dynamics, um, bringing in data sets from, um, from smartphones, from um, call detail records. Um, and here's just an example of the value of doing that in terms of capturing some of these, these dynamics of more mobile populations, of seasonal changes that occur at certain times of the year. And this has led to a lot of our work over the last year focused on uh, COVID response in terms of bringing in this population distribution and dynamics data sets to, to respond and tackle questions about strategies. So uh, any of this finding its way outside of academia, um, some of it doesn't, some of it is crazy ideas that stay within our, within our university. Um, but increasingly we're engaging with uh, governments and end users to produce data sets like this uh, through collaborations and the, the grid three program, uh, producing uh, micro uh, micro plans for polio vaccine delivery and utilizing those. So in the, this is a post campaign coverage survey where these population estimates uh, were used to build micro plans and were used in the northern states and only in those were there were very few areas where, where children were missed and settlements were missed, whereas the reliance on outdated census data in the south caused uh, problems. Um, working with a range of organizations and the Nigerian government on mapping out um, uh, coverage of um, interventions for measles. Um, this is uh, work in collaboration with the government to uh, try and highlight cold spots where vaccination coverage um, is poor. Um, again, as I mentioned, supporting the census process and engaging with, in this case, um, the president of, of Afghanistan and its government in terms of using new estimates to move on from the 1979 census baseline. And this is something that is increasingly being done with uh, governments across sub-Saharan Africa through our um, partnership in the GRID3 program. And this is something I'll talk about in more detail with the methods coming up soon. Um, and also engagement with health and development metrics and strategy. So wherever there is a, a, a need for subnational estimates of births, pregnancies, uh, children under five, or malaria statistics, um, or the, the movement of 
malaria, malaria infections and estimates of those in elimination settings. And then in disaster response, uh, the more rapid uh, analysis in partnership with the Flowmander Foundation, um, looking at uh, population movements from mobile phone estimates to give the broad idea of where populations are being displaced to. Uh, and finally, in the disease modeling setting, so our, our gridded data sets have underlie, uh, underlie a lot of the, the models that you're seeing in the news. Um, Mr. Trump here and Mr. Johnson, our own prime minister, um, based, their, based their decisions of lockdown on models that were built on World Pop data. So I'll stop there. That gives a broad overview, but we'll do some more digging into the actual population data sets and the methods in a few minutes. Stop sharing. Thank you, Andy. Um, yeah, I'm sure that it's already triggering some some questions from our from our participants, but um, I would like to give the floor to Godfrey. As I said, he's the XDX data manager, so he can take us through. Uh, your data sets on on your on World Pop page on XDX. Um, Godfrey, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Javier, and uh, hello to everyone. My name is Godfrey Takawarasha. I work for UN Watchers Center for Humanitarian Data as a data manager on HDX. So today I'll briefly introduce HDX uh, and show you how to find the World Pop uh, data on on HDX. Um, so, uh, as part of the center's data services work, we manage um, HDX, which is OCHA's open platform for data sharing. So, let's take a closer look at HDX platform. Uh, HDX stands for Humanitarian Data Exchange. Um, established in 2014, HDX is an open platform for finding, using, and sharing humanitarian data all in one place. On HDX, you can find and get the latest top line figures for a crisis, create, and explore interactive visualizations, uh, gate boundaries, data, and other raw data to prepare your own um, data uh, products. Um, HTX is the go-to place for humanitarian data. So over 100,000 users visit uh, HTX every month. And there are over 18,000 data sets uh, on HTX. Um, they're shared by over 275 active uh, approved HTX member organizations. Um, next slide, please. Right. For those of you who uh, aren't already using HDX, we hope you will sign up and share data. Uh, please don't hesitate to contact us if you have any questions on getting started or are unable to find what you're looking for. Next slide, please. Right. Now I'd like you to, to, to highlight the World Pop uh, data on, on HDX. So World Pop is one of the uh, active organizations that I mentioned that share data on, on HDX. There are over uh, almost 1,100 uh, different data sets on, uh, on HDX. And you can see on your screen how some of the data looks. Uh, you can find the data by navigating to the World Pop organization page on, on HDX or simply searching for World Pop on the HDX search bar. Um, the following five data sets are available per country uh, on HDX. So each and for, each, for each and every country, we have the age and sex structures. Uh, number two, we have data on the births. Uh, number three, on population counts. Uh, number four, on population density. And then finally, on pregnancies. So these five data sets are available for um, uh, for each country um, uh, from the World Pop uh, data on HDX. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and I'd just like to conclude my, my session by highlighting uh, the data grids on, on HDX. So the data grids uh, show what critical data is available and missing so that all of us can be more focused with data sharing and outreach. Uh, the grids are available on the pages of most countries with a humanitarian response plan, plus a few more. Early next year, we'll be publishing a report called The State of Open Humanitarian Data, based on the insights from these. The grids are currently only about 45% complete across 25, uh, the 29 locations. So please help us uh, find the missing data. That's all from me today. I'll hand you back to uh, Andy to talk more about the 
um, work of graded population data sets and how to use them um, over. Great. Thank you, Godfrey. So I will again share my screen. So I will next um, yeah, walk you through what gridded population data sets we produce and why we produce different versions. So um, this is what I'm really going to give an overview of. Um, firstly, our top-down global estimates. Um, you see unconstrained and constrained. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then uh, the bottom-up bespoke country estimates. And then finally, a, a short bit on a, a web application where you can produce your own more simple, rapid uh, population data sets. So this is the kind of ingredients that uh, and recipe that we use to produce our population estimates. And I'll go through each one of these components so that hopefully you can understand uh, what goes in, um, what the recipe is, and what comes out at the end of it, and where the limitations are, um, and why there are different versions. Firstly, going right to the end here, the population estimates themselves, producing an estimate per grid cell. So why do we do produce gridded data? Um, well, grids give us, firstly, a consistent and comparable format integrating different data types. So we're taking the entire world and we're dividing it up into either 100 by 100 meter grid cells or one by one kilometer grid cells for more easy, easily handleable data sets. Um, it means when we're producing these estimates at this fine spatial scale, we can always aggregate those up to the administrative unit totals, so flexibility and summary to decision-making level. Um, and on HDX, you can um, obtain our data sets summarized by those common operational data set administrative units. So if that's the level that you're working at, um, those estimates can be produced at that scale. But the real benefits also come from integrating with other data sets. So here I have locations of emergency obstetric and neonatal care facilities overlaid on a grid of women of childbearing age. And because of that gridy nature, we can draw circles around each one of those uh, facilities. We can calculate the percentage of women per administrative unit within 50 kilometers of one of those and highlight where are there, there are gaps, where are uh, women being left behind. So, the actual population data themselves that go into uh, the, the models to produce those gridded data sets. Um, as I mentioned already, those data can, we can see lots of challenges across the world, depending on the country we're dealing with and the situation we're dealing with, of um, different types of, of challenges. And the types, broadly, the types of data we're dealing with here are data that are complete across an area. So we have an estimate um, or account for every single enumeration area, or we have incomplete data that comes from a partial census or perhaps some household surveys where there was a listing undertaken. Example here of that complete enumeration for uh, Vietnam, uh, we have an estimate for each one of those districts. Um, whereas in the incomplete section, maybe we have something like Afghanistan here, where only a third of the country has been enumerated recently. Um, or we have something like Nigeria, where actively we worked with field teams who went out to, to small defined areas and counted everybody in those defined areas. And we have about 1,400 of those locations across the country. So those are the types of data that go into the, the modeling. Um, in terms of population, how about settlement? This is pretty vital if we're mapping where people are. Um, if we have a situation like this, where we have district level counts, uh, we have some large areas there, but we don't know where within those areas that people are. We have good settlement data coming from maybe satellite mapping of building footprints or some other mapping of settlements. We can uh, have an idea of actually where within those units those people are. And these are kinds of data sets that are improving uh, every single year in terms of their, their quality, in terms of um, the recentness of the data and in terms of the, the spatial detail. So some of you may be familiar with some of these global data sets. Um, um, but each one of these um, is tagged to a specific year um, and also is not yet at the, the level of computing power to map every single building 
every single scattered small hamlet uh, across every single part of the world. So although these data sets are fantastic, um, they're not yet perfect. Um, but these, these map for, for individual time points. Um, so if we want to map populations from 2000 to 2020 each year, um, what we did was develop a model that draws on each one of those data sets um, as, a, as a kind of tag for the, the time and anchor for the different time points, and then uh, a model to, to fill in the gaps. And you can see the uh, reference there. Uh, Jeremiah and Lee as a PhD student, developed this. And we're estimating set the settlement extent for each year from 2000 to 2020. That's great. It gives us an estimate um, of where those settlements are. But it's only recently when we're starting working with uh, data sets of mapping building footprints from satellites that we see that actually uh, we're missing a lot of very small scattered individual buildings and hamlets and settlements. So um, now these technologies from uh, satellite imagery of the order of centimeters are enabling us to map out um, those data sets. Those, sorry, those buildings. So um, there are data sets across the whole of sub-Saharan Africa being produced by Maxar and Ecopia. Um, and also Microsoft is starting to produce data sets like this. And those are becoming increasingly available. They're not everywhere and, uh, and still the quality is improving. And that enables us not only to map out those small settlements that we've never been able to identify before, but also get to a level of detail within urban areas that we've never had before. You know, to identify certain types of neighborhoods. I'll come to that in a minute. So it gives us these two situations of a, a global and a multi global and multi-temporal look on the built settlement growth model from each year from 2000 to 2020, and then a regional and recent picture of building footprints uh, for certain countries, certain regions um, at a much more detailed level. Finally, uh, geospatial covariates go into the models. So why do, why do we do that is the question. Um, if we have buildings and people, surely we can just uh, put the people into the buildings and produce a population map. Um, the challenge comes when you have a situation like this. You look in any country, uh, you can see two villages that look the same from satellites. And you expect to have a similar number of people. And only when you start to look at things like household surveys, you see actually in one area of the country, there's mean household size per survey cluster as it's uh, far lower than others, around five in one area of the country here, and up to more than 11 in another. And that's because of a range of socioeconomic, demographic, geographic factors. And so we need to try and capture those if we're going to produce accurate population maps. So what we do uh, is try and build up data that can give us some indication of those variations. And that can come from things like densities of schools, roads, markets, places, conflicts. Um, it can come from data from household surveys themselves, household sizes, regional groupings, poverty rates. And it can also come from the building footprints themselves. So we can extract additional value from those footprints. Um, we can look at building densities, counts, areas per grid cell to give us an idea of how populations vary um, likely across urban areas. Um, we can look at the patterns in those building footprints to identify neighborhoods and settlement types. And we can also develop models that uh, are trained on small area data of which buildings are residential or non-residential. Um, and this, this work is led by people within the World Pop Group and its papers are, are down there uh, referenced. Um, and just to flag that those building pattern data sets are, are freely available on our World Pop Open Population Repository. So you can get rid of data sets for all 51 sub-Saharan African countries count density, um, total area, mean area, length, um, and those are freely available. So those go into our, our stack of data sets, along with more standard data on vegetation amount, images of the earth at night, topography, um, and things related to infrastructure. So that's the, the three main ingredients. How about the actual model itself? Well, there's two approaches here that I mentioned already, the top-down approach and the bottom-up approach. The top-down approach is when we have a complete enumeration. The bottom-up approach is when we only have sample data. Uh, they're both using the same covariates um, and producing the same kind of output and really estimates. Um, and uh, before you 
go and choose a population data set that's worth uh, going through this short document on our website to understand those differences. But I'm going to go through um, briefly on these. So again, just to remind you the types of data that we're dealing with here, either complete enumeration or, or partial enumeration. Um, and that's those relate to the top down and the bottom up models and the kind of scenarios that we're dealing with for the top down situation is if I have recent reliable census counts matched to boundaries and want to produce gridded estimates. Or you have some subnational provincial level projections um, that those are too coarse and you want some finer level estimates. Or, or we need gridded outputs that match district unit totals that we already have. Well, the other situation is a census that was so outdated. It's that last census was 1984, so you don't trust that data um, that's projected forward from that baseline. But you do need small area population data and have some recent sample enumeration data. Or I have geolocated listings from a recent household survey and want to use those to build population estimates. So this is why we have these two uh, methods to deal with these two types of scenarios that we're often faced with. Uh, and as I said, both top down and bottom up use the same kind of uh, geospatial covariates and settlement data. And we're aiming for the same outputs, those, those gridded population estimates for, for 100 by 100 meter grid square. So firstly, the top down approach. Um, and you don't need to worry too much about all the details here, but what we're ultimately doing is building a model um, between where we have that density at the coarse spatial population density at the coarse spatial scales and covariates that are available at finer spatial scales. Uh, so we're building a random forest model here to produce estimates. So the example here again is this Vietnam uh, example where we have population counts at this coarse level and at the finer spatial scales we have things like uh, building footprints, settlement maps. Uh, we may have land cover that tells us something about uh, likely population density variations within units. Uh, we may have lights at night from satellites that show something about electrification and variations across the city. So that we can then look at the relationships uh, between this course level and those finer scale covariates and build a, a, a machine learning random forest model in this case to then apply those uh, relationships to predict population numbers at the grid square scale. Um, and this is what we've done as part of a, a project with uh, Columbia University funded by the Gates Foundation. Assemble um, population estimates from uh, census and census projections for each year from 2000 to 2020 for each one of these uh, thousands of administrative units. And then apply the, uh, the, the random forest modeling approach uh, and all of these, uh, these input data sets are described on the website in that link. Um, and apply those to produce these population uh, estimates for each year from 2000 to 2020. You can see an example here from China and the change uh, from in uh, massive growth in the urban areas. And these are all data sets that are available on HDX, uh, together with links to metadata so you can understand what went in, um, something about the model performance in terms of which covariates were used and which uh, helps to explain the most variance in the data um, and information on where each of the covariates was sourced from. Um, importantly, we also make available the, the modeling scripts. So if you have your own data or you want to leave out some of the covariates um, that don't make sense, um, that's available to use. And you can explore the outputs on our own uh, World Cup data portal. So uh, I also mentioned unconstrained and constrained estimates. This is something that we've done recently by, because of availability of building footprint data. So now we have data where we're pretty confident if, if those buildings are mapped accurately, which is not always the case, but if they are, then we, have, uh, we can actually mask out areas where there, aren't, where, where there are no buildings. Um, so this is what's done in our, our constrained data sets. So, um, we have building footprints here mapped for DR Congo. Um, our unconstrained mapping just uh, produces estimates everywhere um, because uh, we don't have data from 2005, for instance, to tell us that there are settlements or not settlements in some locations. But now we have these building footprints, we can constrain our mapping just to those areas where there are buildings mapped. 
And again, there's much more detail on this on our, our website and this link. Um, so finally, for the top down estimates, we produce uh, national uh, population totals, maintaining that census database estimates, but also adjust them to match UN world population prospects numbers. So that's the UN adjusted totals that you'll see. Uh, and then we, uh, uh, this is a whole other talk, but we has, we've assembled uh, a set of uh, data and estimates on age and sex structures each year from 2000 to 2020. And you can explore those in this demographics portal. Um, and those are used to then produce the age and sex structures and also as a basis for the birth and pregnancy mapping. So that's the top down estimates, the bottom up estimates. What, what happens when we don't have complete enumeration? We don't trust those projections. Uh, and this is the case in, in a lot of settings uh, that are under uh, conflict or have uh, instability. Um, 1979 was the last census in Afghanistan, 1984 in DR Congo. Um, and it's not just that situation, it's a lack of complete registry and administrative data to fill in the gaps. Um, and there's a lot of changes that have occurred, even if we are producing a census every 10 years, plus disruptions to census plans from COVID this year. So example here is, is Afghanistan. The last population census was 1979. Its current estimates are largely based on projections. So that means significant uncertainties in national and subnational estimates. Um, but one third of the country has been covered by a rolling census um, with insecurity preventing additional data collection. So this is the data that has been collected in the last five or six years. Um, and we work with the government to do collection in some of those other speckled areas to try and give us as better geographic coverage as possible. But what we do have in those gaps is complete coverage of the country from these geospatial data sets, including the mapping from satellites of all residential compounds. And that means we can look at the areas where we do have data uh, and compare it to those geospatial data sets. So the density of compounds, how does that relate to population density? The vegetation index, how does that relate to population density? Or the fragmentation, how, how broken up is the settlement? Uh, and that's each one of those relationships is often messy and uncertain and not great. But if we measure that uncertainty and we bring all of those relationships together, we can do actually a, a pretty good job in actually leaving out some of this data and, and predicting it um, quite accurately. This gives us confidence of then uh, being able to predict into those unsampled areas based on the geospatial data sets. Um, but importantly, mapping uncertainty because the further away we get from data and the weaker the relationships, the higher the uncertainty. So this is the kind of um, work that we've been doing in multiple countries, uh, largely through the GRID3 program. Um, so this is, you don't need to go into the details here, but this is the scope, the shape of the DRC model. And in each country, we're working with either uh, field teams to go and collect data or a set of listings from household surveys. So there are different variants developed for Zambia, Nigeria, DRC, Burkina Faso, and each one of these estimates data sets is available on our open population repository with, with the thought readme of how the data were produced. And you can also interact with these um, through the WAPA Vision app, World Pop Open Population Repository Vision app. This enables you to then click on a location, and because this is a Bayesian model, um, get an estimate, but also with uncertainty around it. So in this case, for this individual grid square, we're estimating 67 people, but our, our estimate says we're 95% confident that there's between 23 and 152 people. Or we can choose a defined area uh, and get to those estimates, 130,000 in this case, with an upper and lower bound. The value of this uncertainty is, is something like this, how much vaccine do we need? Um, we want to be sure that we're vaccinating all the children under five, so we want to actually use um, one end of that probability distribution. So there's a 90% probability that no more than 923 children under five live here. So we can then take enough vaccine for those 923 children that we be confident. So uh, finally, what if I have my own sample enumeration data or projections and want to produce a rapid gridded population map using those building footprints? Um, so this is situation uh, that we have come across um, and so have built an app to enable you to, to do that. So this is the, the peanut butter app called because we're essentially 
quite a simple model to spread the population across the building footprints, like we would spread peanut butter on bread or toast, and on your preference. Um, we have a disaggregate tool that enables you to do the top-down type modeling from administrative units into uh, putting people into those building footprints, or a bottom-up approach, an aggregate tool that enables you to, def to define those mean people per housing unit proportion of, of footprints that are residential and have some control over the, the outputs that are produced. So that covers all the different data sets um, that we produce um, recently and uh, have done uh, over the last few years. Finally, how are these estimates used? Well, I've covered that a bit in the previous talk, but um, there are some background here on um, uh, more detail here on how these kinds of data sets are used for census planning and preparation in collaboration with UNFPA. Um, we've got examples here of, of working with the Columbia Statistics Office to fill in gaps in their, their recent 2018 census. Um, of utilizing these gridded population data sets to delineate and update enumeration area boundaries or, or sample areas for a uh, sample frame for household surveys. Um, in the, the disaster response arena, um, UNISAT and UNITAR have regularly used these kinds of data sets to link up with things like uh, tracks of hurricanes and estimate those numbers of people that are likely to be uh, affected as those uh, to produce rapid estimates of populations exposed. Um, linking up with things like displacement estimates, um, malaria prevalence uh, estimates, the, the gridded nature of the data enables that linking up with other data sets to produce insights that are, for instance, this displacement tracking matrix, the World Malaria Report, all using these gridded population data sets. Um, mapping access to health facilities and healthcare in Papua New Guinea here with UNFPA, um, looking at the, the estimates of the number of pregnancies within two hours of motorized transports and on, on, on foot. Um, and with the World Bank and UNICEF have, have utilized these data sets to then um, uh, overlay with um, recent data on health facilities offering at antenatal care and estimate those populations who are, who are a long way from reaching those services. And finally, with the grid three program, as I, as I mentioned, micro plans and the, the use of these data in the national vaccination tracking system to design interventions and planning uh, vaccine delivery. Um, in Zambia, these approaches have been used. This is ACROSS planning their uh, resource micro planning for vector control, so distributing insecticide treated nets. Um, and then in COVID response, these data sets have been used in those response hubs. And uh, in uh, Zambia here to, to map out areas of the city that have that are more challenging for, for social distancing. So just pointing to some next steps, um, small area projections, integrating of displacement data is something where we've started working for South Sudan, for instance, where populations are highly mobile and simple projections uh, can be limited. Uh, seasonal population mapping, uh, integrating different geospatial data sets from phones, from satellites to try and capture some of those variations. Um, improving the covariates, so mapping neighborhood types, residential and non-residential and building heights, and testing those in the, in the methods to validate, improve those bespoke models, um, and improving the documentation of our, our methods and communication of those is something that's a big focus area. Uh, and through Grid3, supporting new countries in that work. So just to summarize, um, hopefully you've seen the small area population estimates are pretty much the basis of decision-making across many fields. And in resource poor settings, some of that data can be coarse, outdated, and unreliable. Um, there are a range of methods, growing methods, to complement those traditional data sources, importantly not replacing them, and to produce those timely estimates. But those models are never perfect, so we really need to uh, communicate the uncertainty, the importance of communicating and using that uncertainty and engaging with end users and then capacity strengthening throughout the process to uh, adoption and sustained use. Uh, and thanks to many in the, the World Cup team for their contributions to this and further information there. We'll stop. Hand over for questions. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, we have quite a few questions, so I'm just going to jump right into it. Um, the first question here is from Lisa Jordan. And she says, I appreciate the world pop practices around transparency, but so much data is emerging 
from state and private systems of surveillance whose practices are questionable. Can you share some of the conversations your teams have had around ethical use? Sure. Um, so I guess the, the, the strongest conversations around ethical use come from the use of mobile network data, where there is these data become far more far more sensitive. Um, and for us, um, it's important that often we all we really need is aggregate um, anonymized data um, where there is no way to, to identify individuals. So um, yeah, that's it's an ongoing conversation. It's something where I said ten years ago there was it was quite common for for people to walk into a, a mobile operator and walk out with individual level data. Thankfully, that's something that has changed a lot um, and is improving in terms of um, guidelines, in terms of groups following uh, engagement and. Uh, Data protection laws coming in that are much more much more strong and protect um, end users. So yeah, this this is always something that is is very sensitive, um, particularly around population data. When you've seen how much decision making those are, those determine. Thank you. Andy. Uh, Andy, maybe it's also useful to highlight that uh, all our projects are uh, ethically reviewed by the university committee so basically yeah we, we before starting even to use this data and start uh, i mean any project we have to go through this review and uh, yeah I, I mean until we don't get the green light let's say we are not going to touch even touch uh, those individual data when we when we have them and most of the time uh, our data in any case in any case are uh, kind of aggregated uh, some sort of uh, administrative units Thanks. Thank you, Andy and Alessandro. So our next question is from Bonnie McLean. She writes, I noticed that US data is often missing. I assume this is because they aren't measuring the same metrics. Is this correct? Um, that you, sorry, US data is often missing. That's what she writes, yes. Okay, the yeah, United States data. Um, well, I, I guess because our focus particularly for the first 10, 15 years of world pop has, has been solely on low and middle income countries. And it was only really in the last five years that we have, uh, after a lot of requests, um, particularly from the global health metric field have expanded to, um, to global coverage. Um, and in a lot of cases, if you're looking at an, an, an individual country um, in terms of we did population data sets in, in high income settings, there are often much better data sets for an individual country than, than we produce. Um, we're aiming for consistency across the globe. And so that necessarily means shortcuts. And that when we do country specific focus, we're often focusing on those, those low income settings where there is a real uh, sparsity of data. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, German Vargas is asking, are there plans to add years to the calculation? Currently, population counts go only up to 2020, and the product is incredibly useful. It would be a shame if you didn't. <laughs> yes, uh, we would. Yes, we would really like to do that. And it's something that we are <laughs> searching, I guess, for funding to support, but also have been thinking about methods for, as I put at the end there, uh, projections, which is going to involve then extending forward some of our um, settlement growth modeling. Um, it's going to involve thinking about methods for displacement, particularly in, in low income settings of, of ways of building that into um, Bayesian prediction models so that we can uh, produce estimates at these small, at these subnational scales. And it becomes a, it becomes a hard challenge, quite a research uh, problem. But uh, on the other side of things, we, the, there is the potential to, to link up with the, the world population prospects and utilize the, the, the national projections they produce, at least to do a, a basic set of projections. Thank you. Our, our next question is from Bayram Samet Sahin, who is a statistician with UDA Consulting. Uh, Samet is asking, have you ever conducted ground verification to check the accuracy of gridded population data sets with real figures 
in randomly selected grids? Uh, so this is something that's yet always a high priority, um, particularly when we are producing a population estimate data sets. In the, in the case where we're disaggregating from um, from uh, aggregate counts, there's um, not so much of a, uh, I guess there's still an interest in getting these right, but the, in terms of producing completely new estimates, that's a, a high priority. So what we do is the kind of cross-validation um, leaving out data and seeing how well we predict, but that's that's not ideal. Ideally, we need independent data sets, and those are starting to starting to come. So, working with field survey teams, for instance, in northern Nigeria, um, who have been assessing different gridded population data sets and also against census projections. Um, so, there's a yeah, there's a whole mixture of uh, papers and analysis that are slowly coming out and being produced, and that's really helping us ourselves improve. Those population data sets themselves. So I can um, point people to those um, afterwards if needed. I'll also, just jump out of order here. There's a second question from Ani Steila uh, from IMMAP in Jordan. And, and Ani is asking Has there been any ground truth exercise? Same question to validate the findings of the algorithm, but also how frequently is data collected, especially in countries in conflict like Syria where population movement is quite high? Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a, that's a major challenge. Um, so, what we have, to, so what we've done so far is, um, for instance, we've done mapping in Nigeria and produced a version 1.0, a version 1.1, a version 1.2, and each time is uh, is changing the data that that goes in and updating that and uh, trying to improve things. But uh, these models are really only as good as the input data. The population data. So, if if there is regular enumerations going on to, that can capture some of those changes, then we can feed that into the modeling process. If there is nothing going on, then all we are reliant on is the same relationships, but may be applied to updated mapping of buildings and settlements. Um, and so, the uncertainties become bigger and bigger. Um, but that's definitely something we're very interested in doing. Is these methods are designed for more rapid update, um, and yes, can can support and complement data collection. Um, they're not a replacement, though. Thank you, and I'm sorry for just peppering you with so many questions, but there are a lot of questions that your presentation has triggered. So, just jumping right into the next one, we have from Duncan Hornby. The question is: Are building footprint polygons available from World Cup? On HDX, um, so the building footprint polygons themselves um, have been purchased. I think that the Gates Foundation and the Canadian Development Foundation have worked with Maxar and Ecopia um, to produce those, and I think those can be available upon request um, to nonprofits and academics. So I think that is possible, but we cannot. There's a, the license means we cannot share and reshare the polygons themselves. So what we have done, as I showed, is produce these gridded versions. So um, for each 100 meter grid square, the density of buildings, the area covered, uh, as, as many features as we can calculate. So those are openly available, but the actual polygons themselves not. But then some of the some of, some are from, for instance, Microsoft have made. Uganda building footprint polygons freely available, and there are there are others coming. Thank you, Andy. The, the next two questions are actually from our team at the Center for Humanitarian Data. So the first question is from Tinka, a member of our predictive analytics team. Tinka writes, you mentioned uncertainty estimates of the estimated population. Are these available for download for all countries? Uh, no, not yet. So in our top-down Estimates we don't at the moment have a way of producing uncertainty around them. Um, this has been really focused towards these bottom up um, bespoke data sets where we are estimating into unsampled areas and the, the, the uncertainty becomes much more important there to communicate. Um, so, those uncertainty estimates are available through this WAPA Vision app, and you can download um, uncertainty metrics from there. I think it's a it's a good discussion to have with HDX. We could feasibly provide those 
through HDX as well. And um, it's definitely available. We also have a question from CJ Hendricks, a member of our uh, data systems team. CJ writes, I know that WorldPOP has been working on a tool that would take in geometry, geojson, et cetera, and return back the population estimates within that geometry. Can you update us on the status of that? That's maybe something from Maxim or Alessandro. Yeah, uh, like the provision tool is already doing this. You can upload your uh, uh, geojson and get the total population. And also, if you go to our portal, uh, portal.wallpop.org, uh, it, it will allow you to select area uh, to draw a polygon and it will give you the total population and age and sex uh, breakdown. Sorry, Andy, you were muted. Um, may I ask you to please repeat what you just said? Oh, me. I, I just said thanks. Yes. <laughs> thanks to Max. Uh, and I'll echo that. Thank you, Max. Um, uh, another, I mean, sorry, guys, it's, a, it's an endless number of questions here. We'll try to get it to as many of these as we can. And thank you to all of our participants for, for all of your active and engaged questions. So we have another question here from Amadou Diku. Can we expect the uncertainty layer from the Bayesian estimate to be available for download for all population layer? And another sort of technical question I'll wrap in there. Uh, uh, we have a participant named Alex who says, do you make tiled data sets in addition to geotip? Um, so the, yeah, the uncertainty, uh, yeah, it's partially answered by the last question. I mean, we'd like to certainly work on ways to producing uncertainty estimates around the top down global data sets as well. Um, that's going to need some work and thinking on the methods, um, but the, uh, for the bottom up estimates, those are openly available. So that's fine. And then the Maxim or Alessandro, you want to talk about the tile data sets? Uh, yeah, so they are already available for, uh, I mean, uh, using um, um, service, web services. Uh, is this the, quest, the question? Sorry. It's do you make tile so, data sets in addition to GeoTIFF? Yeah, so we already have it, uh, and uh, it's basically used so far for our uh, portal, as the base for our portal. And we are working on making them available also for RGIS and QGIS user as uh, web services. So this is something that uh, is happening. We are collaborating on this with uh, F3 uh, through Azure, so it will be soonish. Let's say available hopefully during 2021. Well, we've just got two more questions here. Uh, sorry, two more minutes, and hopefully we can squeeze in a, a few more questions. I, I'm not sure we'll be able to get to all of them, but for those who we don't get to, we'll try and answer your questions by email as well. Um, from Miguel Rivera, uh, who is an OCHA Information Management Officer, how are you going to estimate displacement data and what is the timeline for this? This is an extremely useful data set. Um, so I would firstly say to, to go onto our open population repository and look at the South Sudan data set. The README has some description of the methods there. Um, and uh, that's a version one. There's a version two coming very soon. And it's it's using it's a situation where South Sudan has nothing since 2008 in terms of uh, a census and when it was part of Sudan um, and there are simple linear projections have been undertaken uh, but that doesn't take into account displacement so this is bringing together um, uh, IOM's displacement tracking matrix data um, and a set of other forms of data to try and get a better handle on those displacements that have occurred to as a as a method for projecting forward um, those estimates and then disaggregating to the um, to the building footprints. So those are available and you can look on the, the population repository to get some more details. Great. And our last question I'll give to Anita Rito. Sorry for all of the colleagues whose questions we didn't get to today, but we will try and respond by email. Anita asks, um, is there an available buildings or power off input for this? Do you have approaches for night and day population evaluation? Oh, wow. Um, that would be nice. <laughs> um, we haven't. Um, that, there's, 
we have collaborated previously with Flowminder on um, on mapping out day and nighttime populations in Haiti using call detail records, but that's something we don't think we, we don't really have the data to support yet. <laughs> Maybe that's something in the future. Um, but yes, at the moment it's estimates of residential populations, so it's more like nighttime than daytime. Well, thank you very much. And Andy, thanks for being on the hot seat there. Alessandro, Maxine, thank you as well for your input. I'm going to turn it over to Javier for, uh, for the final word. Javier? Thank you, Karim, and thank you, Andy, Alex, Maxime, and Catherine. I see we still have some questions, so um, I'll try to answer those questions via email. There are many questions out there that um, they are very interesting, but you know, the webinar was planned only for one hour. So thank you, Andy and colleagues, uh, for joining us this this webinar and also to the, all the participants. This is our last webinar of the year. As I said, we have an exciting webinars planned for 2021. And, um, and, uh, and join us. We will be uh, promoting those webinars uh, soon. So, um, Nothing else just to say happy holidays and keep yourself safe. And I hope you enjoyed this webinar. Thank you everyone. Bye for now.